Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rob. Let's draw Psylocke. Psylocke is a fairly popular character from Marvel Comics X-Men. She's had several various incarnations throughout her history. Um, most notably, she went from being the English sister of Captain Britain to an Asian ninja with telepathic, telekinetic, they haven't really decided, katanas. And I thought, wow, that's a pretty interesting change, but really, psychologically, what would that do to a person? What would that sort of self-image dysphoria create? I mean, one day, this woman goes from having a face that she recognizes, in fact, she's a model, so she probably spent a lot of time looking at herself in the mirror, to one day waking up and realizing, oh, she's an Asian ninja, and I thought, hmm, that's interesting, let's paint that. So to start with, I've laid out a few guidelines. Nothing too special. Um, it's simple two-point perspective like we've seen before. But here, I'm having the character sit in front of a mirror. Um, it's sort of a rip-off of one of Norman Rockwell's paintings. So I'm not really doing anything too different from his overall composition. It's simply a girl looking into a mirror. Um, the viewer is situated behind the subject so that the reflection is clear and um, really, to get a good reflection is very difficult. Uh, honestly, I should have used quite a bit of reference, but in this case, I simply settle for the next best thing, which is to draw out the skeleton for both the reflection and the initial, the actual character, um, in, in parody. So you saw that I did both spines and both heads and worked my way down that way. Now, I was having some trouble aligning the legs, so what I did was start at endpoints that I knew. For example, the knees. I know where the knees should be in the reflection versus the actual subject. So going from there, I was able to position the femur with the awkward foreshortening on the leg furthest away from us, which was difficult to envision in my head, but much easier once I actually had the knee positioned. I do the same sort of trick for hands, actually. I know where I want the hand to be, so I'll usually place it before I place the rest of the arm, because the arm should follow. Now here, satisfied overall with what I've gotten, I erase my guidelines and start laying in actual detail. I've decided to have the classic Psylocke that everyone knows in the foreground and her reflection be the original Psylocke as she appeared in her first appearance in the X-Men. Now the traditional Psylocke costume is nothing too complicated, it's simply a leotard with a few extra straps on the arms and legs. So I didn't really have to spend too much time working on that. Just sort of knocked it out really quickly so I can move on to the part that would eat up a lot of time, which is Psylocke's original costume. The character was first introduced during a time when fashion was at its most exuberant. This would be the late 70s, early 80s. So the big fluffy sleeves were still in style. Bodysuits were still okay. Things like that. So her hairstyle, even though this isn't exactly correct, her hairstyle I decided to make the sort of 70s kind of feathered look. Um, that was just a personal choice. The, the default, the canon hairstyle was a little boxy and kind of strange looking, so I skipped that altogether. Now here I'm laying in shadows and lighting, simply with the multiply layer and just a black brush just going through knocking it in if I want it darker I bear down harder so that it has more opacity if I don't go a little lighter same as we've done before now here using the gradient to help fill in the background so that I don't spend forever trying to fill it in in the original Rockwell painting 
the lighting was a little indistinct. It seemed like it came from behind the subject, but there was so much darkness it was hard to tell. So that's the assumption I made.
So here I started doing our usual. It's got a two point light source this time instead of three. Um, again, that's owing to the Rockwell original painting that I'm aping. So I focused mainly on highlights to indicate that the light is coming from above, primarily. So the horizontal surfaces on like the bottom eyelid and the top eyelid both have roughly the same value. There is a highlight on her nose and on the top edge of her brow, same concept. These are visual cues that help people establish where a light's coming from. They're not necessary, but as you probably could have seen, it makes a difference once it's there. Now as usual, I'm spending the bulk of my time on this character's face. Even though we have essentially two characters in the scene, this is the only face in the painting. When you first see it, this will be what draws your attention. Now there I just adjusted a bit of my proportions. At some point I stepped back and looked at it realizing that I'd gone a little too anime. Now here, with the lighting on the face established, I'm starting to work my way down this character. I'm trying to maintain a consistent lighting scheme. And that's really the big thing. You just want to maintain consistency. Especially in cases like this where the viewer can't see where a light is. You don't actually need to slavishly follow real physical lighting principles. Just, in, it, in your initial area, find some way to get the lights set up, and then be consistent from then on, and you'll be good. There's no need to try and measure things out or struggle and agonize over where light really is. Just make it right. The sleeves were very awkward. It's a strange material. Some artists depicted it as translucent, others as opaque. So I tried to just think through what made sense at the time. Well, looking at the original Superman movies and a lot of other films from the time period, I'm going to guess that they're translucent. So the parts that don't have the character's flesh behind them have a much higher value than the parts that do. So you see there where the arm can be seen inside of the sleeve, it's a touch darker than the sections that don't have the arm behind it. Doing something as simple as that will get you 80% of the way there as far as indicating translucency. You don't need to actually mix colors. Uh, it helps if you really want to come across as being a, a sheer material. But really the value is what carries most of the information. So as long as you get the values right, you don't need to actually carefully mix in the character's skin color versus the material color, that sort of thing. That's something I would do in a more finished painting, but for just getting the idea across quickly, your values are more important. You can kind of see the distinction between color and value as I do her, this character's hair. See, I established the main bulk with the darkest value that I know that I want, and then I simply increase the value to get the highlights.
There's no need to actually change the color to get these highlights, especially since it's a white light coming from above. So it wouldn't actually change the reflected light coming off of the character's hair. So all I needed here was just simple value changes. Same thing for the rest of her costume. We're not mixing in any color from color information from the light sources. We're simply changing values. Remember, value is how light or dark a particular color is. And the color information is the actual hue, the saturation, that sort of information. You can kind of think of your values scale as simple black and white, a gray scale really. And where a particular pixel falls on that scale is really what carries a lot of the information. I toyed around with the idea of adding a few panels and a little bit of details to the comic books in the character's laps, but I thought that that would add unnecessary detail and draw attention to the wrong thing, so I simply left it out. Now here, filling in the stool that the character is sitting on in the reflection, I made sure that I sampled a lot of the green from the environment. I wanted to give it a very good, strong contrast versus what the actual Psylocke is sitting on. So red and green are opposites on the color wheel, meaning that they'll contrast very strongly. 